Good evening. This is April 3rd in the year 2000 at Natick, Massachusetts. This is part of the Morse Institute Library Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This evening we have with us Jim Craig. Jim, how are you tonight? Very good, John. Uh, do you mind we start out if I ask you your age? I am uh, 54 years old. You had to think about that. Have you had a recent yeah. birthday? <laughs> no, no, I know that I'll be 55 in 2000, so okay. this summer I'll be 55. All right, and, and your you current marital status? I'm married. Children? I have two grown children. Are they grown enough for you to have uh, grandchildren? Um, they certainly are grown enough for me to have them. They, ha they don't have them yet, so we're uh, waiting. Okay. Where were you born, Jim? I was born in Somerville, Massachusetts. Somerville, Massachusetts, and were you raised there? No, I spent uh, probably until I was 14, I lived in Cambridge. And then about when I was 14 years old, I moved to Natick. What was the community like when you got to Natick at age 14? Well, it was certainly drastically different uh, than it is now. I mean, it was, Natick was much less developed. Um, I lived in West Natick. And uh, coming from the city, I thought anything west of West Natick was, you know, the woods. Unexplored. Uh, you know, Route 9 was, you know, basically a two-lane road back in the late 50s, so it was quite different than it is now. And what was your family background? Tell us about your mother and father a bit here. My, my father was, uh, he worked for a company called United Car Fastener that was based in Cambridge. And uh, he had worked there for probably, uh, um, he basically put in over 40 years there before he retired. Uh, my mother was a homemaker. You know, she stayed at home and uh, raised the family, basically. And, and you, did you, you go to Natick schools? I, I went to uh, Natick High School. Uh, I, I moved here when, uh, as a fr after my freshman year. Mm -hmm. and went three years to Natick So you had three years at Natick yeah. High. And when and where did you enter the military? I entered the military June 30th, 1967 at uh, Fort Dix in New Jersey. How come Fort Dix? Um, well, I think back then the, uh, the Army basically was doing basic training um, at a number of bases on the East Coast. Um, Fort Dix basically at that time was the, one of the largest basic training posts. So that's where, uh, that's where I was you know, mustered into the Army. Oh, well did you enlist in the Boston area or did you? Well, I did, yes, I enlisted out of Framingham. Basically mm -hmm. uh, in 1967 the draft was, uh, this was pre lottery or anything like that, and I was drafted and went down and listened to the recruiter and uh, said, gee, okay, I will sign up for three years, and that's what I did. Did you have any choice as to what branch of service you might go into? Um, well, basically to get out of being drafted, you know, I enlisted in the Army. I mean, I. Mm -hmm. I once I got my, my draft notice, if you will, um, I was able to enlist basically in any corps, any branch of the military that would have me. And uh, you know, I chose the Army because I thought I would get the best schooling there. And did you? No. Um, I think like a lot of you know, young men at that point, um, you know, the recruiter would tell you, because recruiters have to meet a quota, they would tell you that, yep, you can do this particular school. And as it turned out in my case, when basic training was over and everybody was told what school they were going to, and I was told I was going to infantry school, I was surprised because I thought I had a commitment from the Army that they were going to send me to uh, intelligence school. And, uh, you know, when I went through the, the process of 
of telling people that I thought I had this commitment, they told me, oh, the recruiter couldn't have promised you that because you're colorblind. So we couldn't send you to intelligence school because part of what intelligence uh, school taught was how to assemble a radio so that you could uh, you know, make communications behind enemy lines or something like that. And you like had that. to know red from green. And if I didn't know which wires to put, yeah. you know, I could uh, light myself <coughs> on fire or something. Did any friends or family join the military when you did? No. You were no. on your own, pretty much. Y yeah, I mean, you know, when yeah, I was drafted and, you know, I was summoned for the pre-induction physical and uh, there were a couple of folks in, in my, um, in the bus that went in from Framingham uh, that I knew from high school. Um, and they had letters saying that you know they had various ailments that would hopefully disqualify them from service. Um, but back then, you know, I I didn't really understand the process, but I knew that uh, that no one in my family, uh, for health reasons, had ever been in the military. So I kind of had this mixed emotion kind of thing where I was hoping that uh, I would pass the physical because I thought, you know, this is something I should be doing. Mm -hmm. Yet I knew that, you know, many people were looking for a way out of it. But yeah. were you aware uh, that you were colorblind? No, no, I wasn't. And um, as it turns out, what it is, it's I have a, I have difficulty distinguishing between different textures, different combinations that are put together, and. Uh, what, what the army, what, what they did at that time was they gave you this this test where you would have to look at sort of like a kaleidoscope of color and read the word that was in, mm -hmm. that was in there. And, and I didn't, you know, I couldn't figure out what I was looking at, so I never could distinguish the word. So that meant that I was colorblind, according to the military. Afterwards, you know, once I figured out how to do that test, I was given it again. <laughs> and, and yeah, you understand. You can you can differentiate. You had so. clues. Yeah. yeah, I you went in right out of high school. Uh, so shall we assume you were not yet married? When I was drafted, I wasn't married. I had uh, you know I gradu. This was a couple of years after graduating from high school. Oh, that sorry, I, was drafted. I missed that. Yeah, yeah I was uh, you know a pretty miserable student in, in college at that point in time really wasn't uh, as serious about studies as I should have been. And uh, yeah, I was basically counseled in school that, uh, you know, at this rate you're, you're not matriculating the way you should. Maybe you ought to think about taking some time off and getting your head squared away. And uh, I took that time off and three years, yeah. got my draft notice and away, you went. You know, away I went. What was your reaction when you, you were told you were going into infantry training? You, you, try, you told them they, you had been given other, another understanding. Yeah. But you, you went into the infantry training. Yeah, I went to infantry training and uh, from there... Uh, was that at Fort Dix? That was at Fort Dix. And that was uh, another eight weeks after the basic training course. And then from there, I went to Fort Gordon in Georgia to, uh, well, actually, no, at, at Fort Dix, I took another course to learn Morse code. And from after that course, uh, which would have qualified me to be a radio man, I, I was sent to Fort Gordon in Georgia, where I was supposed to go to uh, teletype training school learn how to be a teletype operator. What did you like or dislike about the training you took? Um, I actually thought the Army did a good job in terms of uh, once they had you in a training course uh, of you know, presenting material and making sure that, uh, that you understood the material. Um, when I was going through radio school and uh, you know, I, I couldn't quite fathom 
what I was going to do with that particular skill. Um, and as it turned out, you know, those who did well in radio school went to teletype school. And when I processed into Fort Gordon in Georgia to go to teletype school, I was pulled out of line by a, uh, a sergeant in the personnel division and he said, you have very good test scores, how would you like to work in a personnel shop and you'll probably be able to sit out the war right here. And I thought about it and said, yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. So I didn't go to teletype school, I went to work in a personnel shop. And then, you know, probably f that was in November and probably in March, yeah, of, I was notified that I was... Of what a, year? This was uh, November, probably November of 67, November, December in that time frame. Mm -hmm. And then you got to March 68? And then in March of 68, I found that I was assigned to um, an infantry brigade that was forming in Fort Carson, Colorado and was going to Vietnam that summer. So the chances that I was going to sit out the war <laughs> kind of just went by the boards when I got that assignment. Were you to be attached to that brigade as an infantryman or with your new skills? I went to the, um, well I had the infantry skills and I had the personnel skills. Mm -hmm. So initially I was assigned to that unit um, working in the personnel office. Did the military prepare you for uh, cultural differences that you might be facing in the future? If you were gravitating toward the, the Orient, did they talk to you about that? Well, when we were in Colorado and we were as a division forming to go to Vietnam, you know, we had some classes on um, sort of the basic cultural do's and don'ts of how to act in a foreign country. You know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that uh, went into any great depth about any of the cultural mores or the cultural uh, underpinnings of the Vietnamese society. It was more, you know, there were certain things you don't do, you know, certain things are you know, very bad form. Nothing Can you that give it, us an example? Um, I, I don't think I can I really give you an example of what they taught us. I mean, I think it was, um, you know, basically respecting another culture. Mm -hmm. We're there as, as, as guests. We're trying to help them. But, you know, we're not there as, uh, you know, colonizers or owners or anything. It was you know, treat the, the people that you meet with respect, that kind of thing. Were any of the fellows that were on that Framingham bus with you now, are you still pretty much unattached? No, I'm, I'm unattached. I'm, yeah. I'm by myself here. Okay. Um, did your duties change beyond that? You were going out to Colorado and you were going to be an infantryman. Now, when I was out in Colorado, I was attached to a personnel. 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 But unit. in an infantry battalion. It was supporting an infantry yep. brigade, actually. At that time, in, in a, the history of the United States and, and the war, the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. there was no other destination you would go to. You weren't thinking maybe we'll go to Europe or something else. Well, ironically enough, when I was processing into Fort Gordon in Georgia to go to teletype school, when the, the, the personnel sergeant offered me the chance to go to work in a personnel shop, mm -hmm. one of the things he told me was that the last class from teletype school that graduated, that 90% uh, of those people went to Vietnam, 5% uh, went to Korea, and the other 5% stayed in the U.S. So generally, you were Vietnam bound. Well, yeah. I thought by taking the in the personnel position that my chances of going to Vietnam were much less as a permanent party U.S. based personnel yeah. guy. Um, okay, where did you go from Colorado? I went right to Vietnam. Tell us about that. You went out to the coast and 
Uh, did you fly or sail? How we did you? we flew from um, from Colorado Springs. Uh, we went over in uh, C-141 Starlifter planes. Mm -hmm. That's about the biggest they've got. It's about the biggest they've got. Um, it's prob it was probably the equivalent, I think, back then of a seven seven oh seven. And uh, not quite as plush as a, an airliner. But. Did you have an understanding when you left that you would be gone for a year? Yes. So uh, I think your dates are uh, in Vietnam, August 68th through July 69th. Right. So you put in exactly 12 months. I put in a little less than 12 months. Did Steve. you? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Okay. Where did you land? Cameron Bay which is um, south of Da Nang, more or less, and, and uh, one of the major bases where they bring people in, particularly by air. And uh, as opposed to a lot of people who went over as replacements to be sent to various um, brigades or divisions, uh, you know, we landed as, as, as part of a, an infantry division and all the guys that I was on this plane with, we all went to the same place. What was your impression of Cameron Bay? Um, it was really busy. I mean, there were, yeah, when, when our plane came in, which is a big transport plane, and we're being let off on, on you know, the side of the tarmac, you, you could hear fighter planes taking off and helicopters taking off, so you knew that it was, you know, a large base and it was actively involved in supporting, you know, many different uh, requirements than just the movement of troops in and out. Had Lyndon Johnson been there had, when you arrived? Um, I don't know. I don't know. I know he made a, a hurried visit at one time, but I can't put a date on it. Yeah, I, I don't... Uh, being up on the DMZ, we didn't get a lot of you know, high-profile visitors. Tell us about what DMZ is. The DMZ was the demilitarized zone between North Vietnam and South Vietnam. Mm -hmm. um, it was basically area that initially had been uh, supported by the Marine Corps and uh, then had been supported by the uh, um, the first cavalry division and uh, the fifth infantry division of which I was a part of was uh, sort of the third you know large group function to go in and support operations up in that area. Was there a number on your battalion? What battalion? Uh, where you went in this division? Th this was the um, the Fifth Infantry Division, and the the personnel end of that organization was the Seventy Fifth Support Battalion. What did you do right after you got there? What what is, were your assignments? Well, after you um, w when I got there. It was in early August, and the the personnel position that I had um, was not there for me when I got back, and I was assigned as a liaison to the 11th Infantry Battalion, and basically my position. Um, was I was their casualty reporting liaison back to support battalion headquarters. So I traveled for, you know, about six months with the infantry, you know, living with the infantry, doing what the infantry did, and reporting, you know, the casualty statistics back, getting replacements, things like that. What was your rank at this time, Jim? Um, I was a specialist fourth class when I arrived in Vietnam, and I was promoted to a specialist fifth class there, the equivalent of a buck sergeant, basically. 
I've skipped over something that um, people watching this tape I think will want to know. What was like Vietnam like? The, the weather, the humidity, the heat, the feel of the place? Well, when I got there in August, um, it was, I, I believe, the height of the monsoon season. So in the northern part of South Vietnam, it, it would rain, you know, buckets of rain daily. Uh, it seemed like we were always wet. Uh, then as you moved into October, November, December, January, it was much colder than I ever thought it would be in a, you know, what you kind of think of as a tropical country. You, uh, you know, up where we were on the DMZ, it, uh, you know, we were close to mountains. Uh, you know, we were, you know, 30 miles from, from the Laotian border. Uh, it just seemed to be a lot colder during uh, the winter months than I ever thought it would be. Um, but after you go through winter, it was, you know, you get, you know, brutally hot days. Uh, and then the monsoons had come again. Were you in direct combat during the six months? Yeah. yeah. For the f during the first six months, um, because I was part of, you know, basically an infantry battalion, mm -hmm. um, there would be operations that would result in firefights. There would be, uh, you know, the sniper activity, the, the, the shelling, you know, mortars or artillery activity, stuff like that. Physically, where were you? Physically? Yeah, what were you near? Uh, I'm not sure I understand. Uh, some geographic area we might think of. Um, if Quang Tri is the, the, the nearest um, city, if you will, Quang Tri was the capital city of Quang Tri province. Um, but we, we went, we were stationed probably 15, 10 or 15 miles due west of there. Um, places like Dong Ha or uh, Con Tien, uh, th those were probably the, the major towns, if you will, that were near where we were operated. Just prior to your getting there uh, had been the Tet Offensive. Yes. Uh, what did you see the, that showed that had washed over that particular area? You, you could see it simply because the, um, most of the government offices and buildings in Quang Tri City um, you know, had been shot up. Um, for me, I think what was the, the most significant um, thing. It wasn't really associated with Tet, but it was associated with the uh, um, the Marines and, and the siege that the Marines went through up at Quezon. Because after after that siege had broken, um, you know, Quezon was abandoned, and you know we did operations up through that area. And you could see the, the craters, and you could see all the burnt out uh, bunkers and things. Um, so it kind of it gave you this, you know, very uh, surface understanding of what the Marines had gone through, you know, sitting on this pile of uh, real estate for, you know, so many days getting bombarded and shelled day and night. and. Um, and then it was abandoned. Can you tell us about uh, support you received from other units or air support that you received? The, um, the, the air support uh, is kind of like two levels of, of air support that I you know, can visually uh, or you know, that I can conceptualize. One was the, the, the fighter support that you would get 
uh, from the Air Force. The other was the, uh, the small plane uh, artillery spotters that you would get from the Air Force that would uh, fly around in these small, almost like Piper Cubs. And they would just expose themselves to be able to call in you know, accurate artillery and accurate gunship support. Um, yeah, that's that's always kind of stuck in my mind is uh, something that the, the the people who did that you know didn't quite get the credit I think that uh, they should have gotten for that activity. Were you at that time physically lugging a rifle and firing at other people? The first six months I was there, yeah. Second six months I had a rifle. Uh, you know, you pull guard duty, you pull um, ambush patrols and things like that, but uh, it was different from physically being in the field for days at a time. Do you have any idea what units you were uh, up against? No. Um, th th there was there was always talk that the, the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese Army was always just across the DMZ and it was always like the the 330th Infantry Battalion or the, the 339th Infantry Battalion of the North Vietnamese Army that was always, you know, across the river in the mountains somewhere. Yeah. You said that your job, part of your job at least, consisted of reporting casualties. Yeah. Um, specifically, what did you have to do? You would have to um, notify the, um, the main casualty uh, reporting operation at, which was part of the, uh, you know, the the uh, brigade headquarters, you'd have to notify them of individuals, their name, um, you know, name, rank, service number, next of kin. Um, you'd have to process all that, how they got wounded, um, if they were medevaced, where were they were going to be medevaced to, so that they could always track, um, you know, people who were airlifted out during firefights and things like that. How about the other side of that, the, the body count of the enemy? Who did that? Um, I, I think there were probably two ways that, that body count um, was established. One, I think that, you know, the, the infantry line companies, um, you know, always had to get, you had to report back on the body count. So I, it w I think it would be the riflemen, the, the platoon leaders of the rifle, um, of the, you know, the infantry squads, they would be responsible for reporting any, uh, you know, enemy dead, wounded, or captured. Do you feel your officers gave you good leadership at this time? Um, I mean, it's tough to answer that looking back. I mean, I think that, you know, the, the one thing that, that was, I think, evident to a lot of people was that um, infantry officers were, you know, the lead in terms of casualties. Um, so, and, and with, with one-year tours, um, you, you didn't always have an experienced person to put in charge of a, of a rifle company because there were no experienced people. You know, sometimes you had to have, um, you know, an infantry lieutenant who had uh, just, you know, finished his basic training, finished his officer's candidate school, mm -hmm. and his first exposure to combat was, you know, in your platoon, your company. Um, yeah, I, I think they were prepared as good as they could have been prepared, knowing that they were running through these people 
yeah. at, a, at a significant rate. What about you personally? What, were, what did you feel the, the greatest challenges you faced in those days? Um, I, you know, initially it was you, you're, you're so keyed up about trying to make sure you don't make a mistake, trying to make sure you don't you know, step on something that could hurt you, trying to make sure you don't um, make some mistake that will expose you or expose um, you know, your, your fellow soldiers to some kind of harm. Then, because not every day was a combat day, sometimes we would go three weeks and other than getting sniper fire or you know, maybe some artillery, you wouldn't, have a, you wouldn't actually have an engagement. So you'd, get, you'd kind of get, you'd relax and you'd say, hmm, this isn't so bad after all. And then something would happen that would you know, bring you back to your senses, but you know, when, when you went for a bunch of days with nothing happening, you know, you said, mm, this is okay, I could, you know, I could do this for a while, and you find yourself, you know, not paying attention like you really would if you thought that somebody was going to do you harm. Did you go out on patrols into enemy territory? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about uh, gearing up to do a thing like that? Well, it seems like there was a maybe two kinds of patrols you'd go on. One is you would, you know, we, we think that the enemy is located somewhere out near here and we, you know, we want you to go out and see if they're there and if they're there, you know, you engage. Then there would be um, ambush patrols that you would go out on where you would go out to basically a spot that was um, identified as being well trafficked with uh, you know with enemy uh, soldiers and you would uh, you would lay an ambush and you would sit and wait and basically uh, hope that somebody came into your ambush and you would fire away uh, that's kind of basically the type of patrols that we went on were you wounded at any time in combat? No. Were men around you injured, killed? There were men around me that were injured. I don't, I don't believe, and there's only one person who I think might have been killed, and um, I guess until I go see the wall, I won't know that. From your perspective, uh, in seeing men in combat, uh, do you feel that um, they received good medical care or were treated um, very quickly, evacuated? Um, you know, I think there's, there were always times when you, it, it didn't appear that the medevac was coming quick enough um, because you're, you're looking at guys that are you know, losing blood or don't have part of a limb or something, and you know you're thinking that if it's got to happen now. Um, but but I think overall, I think that uh, there there was probably no better job done than by mm -hmm. the people who flew, you know, the medevac uh, choppers and things like that. How did you hear about what was going on um, in other parts of Vietnam, but also what was going on in the States at this time? You, you really didn't have, I mean, the news from the States you get from, from family and from what other guys are getting from family. Um, you really, unless you met somebody who was, you know, from, one of the other regions of Vietnam, or unless you met somebody when you were on R and R who was from somewhere else, you really didn't have, you know, a, a great feel for what everybody else was doing.
Lyndon Johnson in October of that year ordered the cessation of bombing of North Vietnam. Did you guys hear about that and think about what relevance it had to you? Um, For a second part of that, Richard Nixon was elected president in November. Did you feel that might change your lives? Well, I think when, when Richard Nixon uh, was elected, um, yeah, I, mean, I think the feeling was was that he was um, that as a Republican, he may want to do something different than than what Lyndon Johnson and what John F. Kennedy had done. Um, you know, '68 it was still you know fairly high profile. There was still more people. The draft was at its height. Yeah, I, I don't think too many people, myself included, felt in 1968 that. Uh, that this was going to wind down anytime soon. I think it was in June of 69 that um, Nixon met with President Tew and said, we're taking back 25,000 men. And that was the beginning of the Vietnamization of the war. Um, you, you heard about that just before you left, I would assume. What impact did that have on you? Um, you know, I think that that in 1968, 1969, I, I don't think there was too many people uh, up where I was on the DMZ that that thought that the Vietnamese could take on the task themselves. I, I don't think there were too many people who who thought that had a whole lot of future to it. In the fall of that year, and I'm, I'm skipping ahead to the fall, but there, there were preludes to this. Very large protests against the war were beginning to form in the United States. Uh, the largest of them was in October, but there were smaller ones, a little of, of the thunder on the horizon. Did you folks hear about that, and what was what? What were your thoughts about that? Uh, certainly, we heard about it. Um, I, th I think there were. I think there was a fair amount of folks, myself included, who thought that um, you know th this is a civil war. Anybody who thinks we're winning this war is is crazy, and that getting out of Vietnam was probably not a bad idea. I think what affected me and probably many people like me was that you know that guys like me with who were just doing you know what we were told, obeying the orders that were given to us, were there because the government sent us there. I think many, many of us felt that um, th the protesters were, were holding um, you know, the wrong people to task here, that they were, um, you know, they were dumping on individual soldiers and they were, you know, calling them murderers and calling them this and that when, you know, that wasn't the case and that it was a, you know, it's a government policy that you're dealing with, not the, the people that uh, are, are tasked to carry out that policy. Can I ask you if you, uh, the men in the field at that time, discussed this openly, whether or not you should have been there or a, a policy was stupid? Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, the answer to that question is yes. I think we um, we certainly discussed it. I mean, the, the military in 1969 was, particularly the military in Vietnam, was starting to really, you know, come to grips with the problems that were affecting society everywhere. I mean, there were, um, you know, that's when Black Power was getting. You know, significant play in the military. 
that's when um, you know officers were getting fragged. Please explain fragging. Um, what, what fragging was back in 1969, 1970 or whatever was that if, if people felt they had an officer who was you know, just a miserable person, if they felt they had an officer who was endangering them because of, of how he led them in the course of uh, you know, a combat operation, maybe if he imposed too much, too severe a level of discipline. Uh, by fragging, what that meant was they would take her grenade, pull the pin, throw it under his, his hooch or his tent or wherever he was living, and they would blow it up on him. It's kind of sending him a message <laughs> in a big way that, uh, you know, not everybody supports what you do. I have a note here that uh, in August of 69th, of 69, Soldiers of a light infantry brigade in Vietnam, after five days of heavy losses, refused to go into battle. I, I have no idea where this was, but did you ever hear of any units anywhere on the line that just said, we've had enough? No. No, I, I've never heard um, of any units that, that did that. And over the years, I've, I've tried to read just about anything I could read on, on Vietnam, and, and I know that there were, you know, there there were, there were battles that, you know, the the U.S. just took significant casualties in, and the objectives of the battle were questionable. Uh, but I had never, when I was there, heard um, of a unit refusing to. Mm -hmm. I mean, usually, usually they're there. They're getting wailed on. You know, you you, you got to defend yourself, or you're not going to live. I think they, you know, they. I, I never heard of anyone saying, you know, that's it. I'm, I'm, I'm quitting. You you spoke about being on the line. I think six months. Did yeah. that mean that you left that area after six months? Um, yeah, what, you know, I, I moved probably five miles from from where the infantry battalion was headquartered back to where the the brigade headquarters was. At any time, were you close enough to the enemy for them to communicate with you? That is, did you ever get leafleted or loudspeakered or whatever they might do to try and dissuade you? No, I mean we used we had on on our perimeter, you know, we had loudspeakers, and, and we would periodically, you know, try to convince whoever was out there to to give up and to come in. And was that successful? I don't think so. I think it was, you know, it's, it was kind of more a harassment kind of thing. Okay, so you're back now five miles away from the DMZ. Are you in a safer place or? Much. Much. Can much. you tell us about what you're doing there? I, I was given an assignment that um, was responsible for getting those people who were coming back to the States that still had time left to do on their enlistment my responsibility was getting them assignments so that they could rotate on time back to the States. Was there any effort made to uh, take men off the firing line after they'd been there as long as you had a rotation system toward the rear? No, I, I don't think there was. I think that um, th the only reason I was in attached to the infantry company was because I had messed up and the, the individual, the, the warrant officer who was running the personnel operation where I, um, where I was supposed to be assigned, um, justifiably felt that I had 
let him down. And he needed somebody out there in the field, and that's where I was sent. Um, after six months, yeah, he basically uh, came out to me and said, would you like this assignment back here? And I said, yes, I would. But, but I, had, I had let him down. Um, Do you want to tell us about that? Well, yet to put it in a nutshell, um, before I went overseas, I got married. And after a three-day honeymoon, I was supposed to be back to uh, go overseas. And I wasn't ready to go. So I stayed an extra three days, and then I went. And it cost you six months on the line? Yeah. But he, he had, he, he didn't have to let me come home to get married, and he did. And, uh, and then by staying the extra three days, um, you know, I let him down. So, I mean, I, when, when he told me where I was going, I, I had no beef with him because, you know, I did let him down. That's the rules. It might have been a nit. Yeah. might have been small, but I let him down and, uh, you know, I had to pay. Let me ask you uh, what you knew about the enemy you were going to face before you got on the line. How much preparation? Uh, what were you told about who was out there? Well, what we were basically told was, other than us, the U.S. forces, everybody out there was probably an enemy. You couldn't trust women, you couldn't trust children, um, and you really had to really watch the, the South Vietnamese because they were going to go whichever way the wind blows, and you couldn't, yeah, you, know, you couldn't trust whether they were with you all the time or not. So it was basically everybody is, you know, watch out for them. The massacre at My Lai took place in March. Uh, William Calley, mm -hmm. Lieutenant William Calley. Um, did you guys hear about that when you arrived? No, I don't know. That didn't break until later. I don't think that broke till. You know, probably uh, sometime in the early 70s, I don't think. What was your opinion of the North, Viet uh, North Vietnamese before you went into battle? Well, I, I think they had been pretty much built up to us as being, you know, they were a real army. Um, they are equipped like a real army. Um, you, 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 know, you best treat them like they are trained soldiers. It's not a, you know, it's not a ragtag army that's been put together just to, you know, to wage this war that, you know, the North Vietnamese Army has been fighting for, they've been fighting this battle for 20 years. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of experienced guys there. So you respected the guys on the other side of the line? Oh, I think we did, yeah, yeah. What about their weapons? Weaponry. I mean, it's you know, they had stuff that could kill you. I mean, they had uh, you know excellent mortars. Um, you know, AK-47 was probably their main rifle. Um, you know, we, we up where we were, we had operations that went into the Aishal Valley, and you know, we had guys report that they had tanks. So, you know, a lot of stuff had to come down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, but, you know, I don't, I don't think anybody ever thought that they were fighting somebody who didn't have, you know, the equipment that it took to, you know, wage the war. 
Did you serve out your time in Vietnam in this post that uh, you finally were moved to? Yeah. So after six months, you were, you're, you're up to July of 69, um, and you had been counting the days. Absolutely. Uh, and did they very meticulously bring you home on time? Actually, um, I wasn't there 365 days to the day. Um, my job was getting people assignments back to the U.S. Once I had decided for myself that I wasn't going to extend, I wasn't going to stay in Vietnam, I could have stayed in Vietnam an extra six months and gotten out of the Army, you know, early. How much time did you have left on your three-year enlistment? Uh, I was going back in July of 69 and I had to serve until June 29th of 1970. So if I'd have extended for six months, I could have got out of the Army five months early. But you chose not to. Yeah, I just thought that that would be, well, you know, I, I, had, a, I had a daughter who I'd never seen. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Oh, you, you hadn't told us that. Yeah, no, I had a daughter who was born, you know, in March of 1969. I had never seen her. In fact, when I found out that I was a father, they initially told me I was the father of a boy. But when they told me it was a boy named Michael, I knew it was a girl named Michelle. <laughs> and and they, then they came back and told me, we made a mistake, sorry. But, um, but I, I looked at that and I looked at where I was. Um, and I just, it said it, was, it wasn't worth it to try to save five months by staying longer for six months. So as the guy responsible for getting people reassignment jobs, I had, I'd already had my job and uh, I was able to leave probably a week early and it was probably one of the dumbest moves I ever made. We'll get back to that in a second, but tell us about uh, your feelings about leaving Vietnam, leaving the men you'd been with for uh, up to a year? Well, I mean, most of us, were, we were all doing the same thing. You know, we all came over together. Most of the guys that I came over with had already, were either in the process of going back, had already left the Army. Um, so it was, you know, I'm just one of a bunch, and I'm, I'm a little later than these guys because I went a little later. But the guys that I came over with, we were all, they were all leaving. And, uh, you know, I was one of the last of the originals. Philip Caputo and others who have written about their experiences over there, it, it stands out in my mind that the transition, one day in your Vietnam and the next day you're in San Francisco, how did, how did that go down mentally? How can you do that? Uh, you, you're so excited about leaving um, that I mean, you're not prepared for the transition. Um, you know, one night you're in Cameron Bay, you know, transit barracks. The next morning you get on a plane. And in my case, I'm at Fort Lewis in Seattle, Washington. And, you know, I'm being outfitted with, you know, new new fatigues, new, you know, dress greens to wear. Um, you know, they, they give you the medals that you've, you've, you're entitled to wear. They give you a steak dinner. And then they, they give you the ability to get home or wherever you're going from there. And, and it just, it flows continuously. And uh, I got to Chicago and, uh, you know, I called my wife, and you know, who hadn't seen me in a year, and I told her I'm in Chicago, and she said, "Oh, when will you be in Boston?" <laughs> and I said, "Well, I think I'll be in Boston about 11 o'clock." She goes, "Okay, bye," and she hung up. 
And I'm thinking, you know, this is, this is pretty strange. It's the real world. <laughs> this, is the, this is the real world. And, uh, you know, people looked at you a little differently, I think, because, you know, that was, you know, there were a lot of military guys coming home from Vietnam. And, you know, they, they all weren't, everybody wasn't popular. No, and I'm going to ask you that in a minute, your feelings about that, but uh, let's get back to the biggest mistake you ever made. Why was that a bad move on your part? I'm not sure. You told us trading off the five months for six months wasn't a wise thing to do. Oh, no, that, that, was, that, that was, the decision to go home was, was the right thing to do. Um, and I had the ability to determine within a week or so when I would leave Vietnam. So my orders were cut for a specific date. And it was a week in front of when I was really supposed to go home. So I was asked to bring, every battalion has a liaison in Cameron Bay that's a responsible for making sure their guys, you know, get through okay. Uh, if there were people there in the medical detachment that they got their mail, that they got whatever they needed. And uh, I was asked to bring this guy down uh, a 45 caliber revolver. So I caught my flights down and got into Cameron Bay at probably Eight o'clock at night, and you know, got to the base, found this guy, was was sitting with him in his um, hooch having a beer, and all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. And basically, what had happened was that the uh, the Cameron Bay installation had been penetrated by. Viet Cong sappers, and they had uh, gone through, and and most of the, most of the the barracks that these sappers had shot up were uh, barracks that contained injured people, you know, guys that were recouping from from wounds of one sort or another, and. It was one of those things where you, you go running out into all this craziness and you see the right form factor that's not, you know that's not a, an American guy. So you go running after that guy and you realize that you have a weapon with no clip in it. Because the clip had to be separate from, couldn't fly with a loaded weapon. Um, so the whole idea of getting out a week early you know, put me in the middle of this, this, you know, sapper attack. And, and then when I came home, I found out that it was in the news. And that, um, you know, my, my wife had said, boy, did you, did you hear about this? And it was the, the sapper attack at the Cameron Bay base. And it talked about, you know, three people wounded or something. And, and that's when I knew that the, you know, some level of data that was being supplied back to the American people was being doctored because, you know, I saw a lot more than three people wounded. And I, I saw the dead people that were the result of this attack. And, you know, you, you kind of see right there that, you know, the whole thing about whether the American people were being told the truth or getting all the right information back from Vietnam kind of crystallized it for me that, no, they weren't always getting the right information because the American people would not put up with the fact that, you know, that their, that, that their wounded people were not safe, that they were being, you know, that they could be attacked, you know, by an enemy who would be so ruthless as to, you know, shoot up injured people. But, you know, there it was. So that could have been, that, that whole thing of leaving a week early, you know, about backfired on me. You could have gotten into some pretty serious trouble that night. Well, yeah. I mean, I f 
I was if I was asleep, I would not have probably gotten out of that hooch. You know, but I wasn't asleep. We were awake. Did anyone you know uh, get hurt that night? Did you leave somebody behind? Any? Well, I didn't leave anybody behind because the only individual I knew was the guy that you know that was our casualty thing, and and he and I were in the the same place. Um, you know, when these guys burst in and you know started firing at anything and everything, and uh, you know we both were okay. Okay, that for you at least had a happy ending, and you're back in Chicago and arriving in Boston yeah. at 11 o'clock at night. Uh, rendezvous with your wife and new daughter, mm -hmm. and you've got how much time left in the Army now? Um, this is the end of July, and I have to go to the end of next June. So it's basically 11 months. And what did you do in that 11 months? I was assigned to Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Indiana. That's where the Army trained finance and personnel folks. And my job initially was to, uh, I was responsible for officers' records, making sure that the officers' personnel files were up to date, that they had all the awards they were entitled to, uh, things like that. I was also, uh, because I was one of the only guys on the post who had been um, to Vietnam, I was uh, put on the color guard, and uh, I was also responsible for leading a, a uh, a detail of men that would go out and uh, and attend funerals and be responsible for burying people that were uh, killed in combat. Did you serve out your time there? Yes. Yeah. At the end of your, your that was three it. years? Yeah, that was it. At this time, and you alluded to this just a few minutes before, um, Guys coming home from Vietnam weren't treated as, treated as the ones coming home from WW2 and maybe Korea. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us about the reception you got? Um, actually, and I wasn't quite sure how I got roped into this, but in, in 1970, when I came back to Natick, um, a, a friend of mine who had been in the Army but had only served in, in the United States um, asked me if I was interested in joining Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that because I've, you know, I basically don't, I joined the Army but I never joined anything else. But I thought that would, yeah, to some extent, I think some of what Vietnam Veterans Against the War stood for was, was something I believed in. So I actually marched in the Natick Fourth of July parade um, in 1970, six of us, as Vietnam Veterans Against the War. And you know, people were yelling at us and spitting on us and you know, calling us everything in the book. And, uh, you know, it was kind of an eye-opener, yet, you know, I knew that just, just marching that early as Vietnam veterans against the war, I mean, we, were, we certainly weren't John Kerry or any of the more visible Vietnam veterans against the war, but, you know, it wasn't a popular thing to do, and, you know, I knew it wasn't a popular thing to do. It's a sort of dichotomy, a dichotomy in the American spirit. In um, April of 1970, Massachusetts enacted a law exempting its citizens from having to fight in an undeclared war. And the United States Senate that year repealed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Thousands of people all over the United States were protesting the war. You did, and yet you were vilified for it. Um, I guess that suggests America didn't quite know what to make of this. Um, I, I think, in general, 
we have a hard time as Americans distinguishing between civil wars and you know the interest of of our government and the governments we support. Um, you know, certainly when I was in the army, you know, I didn't have that. I didn't have a vote. You know, it wasn't up to me to decide policy, um, but it was certainly up to me to to do what I was supposed to do. Uh, you know, I, I think. You know, Vietnam veterans have kind of had this thing to live with, probably more so than any other um, veterans of any other conflict, where they served and then they came back and some of them protested, or they served and some of them came back and had, you know, flashbacks for, you know, any number of years afterwards. Um, I think, and, and I'm not certainly qualified to to say. But I think there's, you know, when you're in a war that's not declared, when you're in a war that's not popular, when you're in a war that the country isn't united behind, um, you know, you're going to get this mixed reaction from people. Some will support you. I mean, this is Massachusetts. We're always kind of a shade to the left anyway, so uh, some will not support you. And, in 1995, Robert McNamara, then Secretary of Defense, uh, one of the best and the brightest, wrote his book uh, called An Introspection of Vietnam, uh, in which by page three he said, we made a mistake, we never should have done this. That being so, and your experiences, what do you do now at, at your age and looking back on all this, how, how have you come to grips with this? Um, it, uh, maybe it's the cynic in me, but you know, I, I thought he was absolutely copping out when, after, you know, after thirty or thirty-five years, you know, he fesses up and goes, "Yep, I was wrong." Um, I think the, the government had a fairly there was a pattern of conduct that guys like McNamara engaged in to to drum up support for that conflict. And uh, I just, uh, you know, after the fact stuff is, uh, you know, I mean, we, we had to, we signed up to support the South Vietnamese and uh, whether it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do, uh, you know, a lot of guys went over there and, and did their jobs and unfortunately a lot of them, you know, didn't survive, but I guess that's what that's what happens when you serve. The government can call you to serve and send you into a conflict. Are you currently a member of any veterans organization? No. Can you tell me why not, or why, or why not? Well, I mean, initially I was just so. You know, once I had that crap for marching with Vietnam veterans against the war, you know, I said, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to join. One of these organizations where, um, you know, it, it's my country, right or wrong, my country, and if you don't always salute the flag, you're a bad guy. And I just, just that, just that reaction to, to kind of being pounded a little bit for, for marching to support ending a war that in retrospect everybody says, yeah, it should have ended or, or it should have ended earlier or it was a mistake. But just the act of, of doing that and, and knowing that other veterans of other conflicts were saying, you know, you are bad news or, or whatever, you know, being part of the people that were yelling at us and, I mean, they didn't want to let us march. The other veterans didn't want to let us march. Um, but I'm not a joiner, so. You know, I, I, I know that uh, the times were different, the, the events were, were different, um, and the veterans who were, were, were pounding on us and yelling at us, um, you know, they had a very legitimate viewpoint. Um, but I just, I'm not a joiner. And 
and I've never joined a veteran society. Jim, how important to you was serving in the military? It was, it was sort of, um, I, I was the first one in my family that was ever, you know, fit enough to pass the draft or to pass, you know, getting inducted. And, you know, my father and all of his brothers um, had, had a history of asthma and lung problems that disqualified them from military service. So when I knew that I was going to be the first, it was kind of, I don't want to pass this physical because I know where it could take me, but I do want to pass this physical because... For the same reason. It's my job. I mean, it's, it's an obligation that I have as a citizen, and at some level, I knew that this, this was the adventure of my generation. And um, I, sh I should be a part of it. In that adventure, is there a memorable, one outstanding memorable experience that you recall when you think Vietnam? What do you think? Um, I, I guess it you know, depends on what's. I, mean, I don't think much of it now. Quite frankly, um, I, I think of some of the things that I was willing to do um, as a soldier that you know is not typical of me, and that I could have got out of, but I didn't. Um, you know, some of the the combat type situations that I was willing to expose myself to um, that, that I didn't have to, but I knew that it was part of being a soldier and, and, and I wanted the experience of, of being a soldier and being able to look at people and say, you know, I, I didn't sit at a desk the whole time, that I was willing to put myself out there and take the chances that that guys that didn't have scores that I had or whatever that would allow me to get a um, personnel job that you know they knew they were going to be you know ground pounders and they knew they were going to be out there until their one year was done. Um, you know, it, was, it was it was doing that. It was you know I mean I I went into a tunnel and. You know, we found documents and we found rice. I was thankful that we didn't find anybody there. But I knew I wanted to do that. You know, when they said, we need somebody to do that, I said, yeah, I'll, I can fit, I'll go down. Not knowing what I would find, but knowing that if I didn't do that, I would question myself about, you know, is it because you were afraid? Yeah, of course I was afraid, but you know, if but I didn't do it, I'd have, you know, I'd have questioned myself probably to this day. Is there anything I haven't asked you here tonight, or is there any one last thing that you would like very much to be part of this tape? Um, no, I mean, I, you know, I. Vietnam for, for folks, you know, like me, um, I had no friends from here that went over. Most of my high school friends that I was very close with, none of them were drafted. They all managed to, to not have to, um, you know, participate. And, and I was, it, it, when I was there, I was glad that some of my close friends and, and things weren't, weren't there. And, but, but for me, it was, I, I'm glad I went. I'm glad I got to, you know, observe some 
some portion of uh, just a major event for the country. And uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, I don't think I was probably the greatest soldier, but uh, you know, I was okay. Jim, thank you. It's my pleasure. We appreciate your being here tonight. My pleasure. Your very eloquent statement here. Well, it's a very good uh, service that this is all about because I think capturing what veterans have gone through, particularly the veterans that uh, aren't World War II, that are Korea and other places, you know, there's just a great story to tell here. I'm glad you're doing it. Thank you. Thank you.